Did Albert Einstein really invent the grad cylinder? That was the question that started off this whole video. I was working on another project about glassware, and I came across the grad cylinder, and so I did the thing anyone might do, and I asked Google, who made the grad cylinder? And Google told me that Albert Einstein did it in 1909, and I found that extremely hard to believe, because how the heck were people measuring stuff for over a hundred years before that? How were they doing it? I could not believe for the life of me that anyone would believe that Einstein was the first person to make a grad cylinder. I thought that that was absolute baloney. A couple other places on the internet said the same thing. Several different links keep coming back to this Einstein inventing the grad cylinder, and I'm like, that's baloney. Here they even reference some book, and I went and looked at this book, and it doesn't even talk about the grad cylinder anywhere, so I don't know what the heck is going on here. So I decided to get to the bottom of who actually invented the grad cylinder, and why can't I find the answer to it for the life of me online. So I hope you enjoy this interesting story, and let's get started. Did Einstein really invent the grad cylinder? So grad cylinders are a piece of glassware used for measuring liquids, and you can do so usually precisely. Typically you have graduations, as well as some like smaller graduations between each measurement. This could be 10 milliliters made of glass, it could be made of plastic like this one shown here, or it could be one of these taller ones. Now, you've probably worked with a grad cylinder at some point in your life. If you've gone to high school, you've probably done chemistry and you've used a grad cylinder at some point in time. And they often have these little yellow things on them. I just wanted to take this opportunity to tell everyone what they're actually for. The main purpose for these is if the whole grad cylinder falls over, if it catches on the yellow instead of on the tip, it doesn't shatter. So the main reason that these are on there is to prevent them from shattering, although some people also use them for measuring the liquid, but in my mind that doesn't make any sense because you're just going to be covering up the meniscus, and then you can't measure the liquid accurately. So we're measuring things in milliliters. When was the milliliter invented? In 1795, the metric system was formally defined in French law, and when this happened, both the gram and the liter were defined. There was a committee of five French scientists that were appointed by the French Academy of Sciences, and together they decided what the standard units would be for various different measurements. So this happened in 1795, and that's a date we want to remember, because that's probably an important time relative to when the grad cylinder was invented, right? You'd think that it was probably closer to the 1800s that the grad cylinder was invented, rather than 1909 by Einstein. Like seriously, that's over a hundred years later. You really think that after the leader was defined, it took a hundred years for someone to think, oh, what if I make a tower with a whole bunch of these? Yeah, I know, right? It boggled my mind that anyone thought that that was the correct answer. And so let's talk about what the correct answer is. But before we do that, let's first define what is a graduated cylinder. Because at one point in time, this was not necessarily called a graduated cylinder. There's a lot of different places in the world. They speak different languages. Maybe this wasn't called a graduated cylinder to start with. There are a few necessary things for a grad cylinder. First of all, it has to be a cylinder. It can't be a different shape. It has to be cylindrical. Additionally, it has to be graduated. It has to have indications marking volume. These should be several increments of equal volume, such as like one milliliter, five milliliter, 10 milliliters, etc. Doesn't even necessarily need to be milliliters, right? It could be anything, as long as it's a graduated cylinder. And when you're measuring, it should be possible to do precise measurements. So if you have something like a beaker, if you have a few drips extra, you won't be able to tell whether or not you're close to the line. So for precise measurement, this can't be a beaker. Now there are a few things that are optional. You can decide whether or not you think these are necessary for it to be considered a graduated cylinder. In my mind, these aren't as crucial. The first thing would be a base or a foot so that the thing can stand on its own. I think if it doesn't have a foot, it's probably still a graduated cylinder because when it's sitting with liquid in it, you're not using it. When you're using it, it doesn't need to be sitting down. So in my mind, it doesn't need the base. That's really just a practicality thing. It should also have major and minor increments so that you can easily look at where you're at but then if you need to know specifically where you're at, you can take a closer look and look at those fine lines. Of course, the last most important thing is that it's so tall that it's easily able to tip over and break because that's what grad cylinders do. I think most grad cylinders I've ever seen have either broken or have been slowly chipping away at the top or the bottom. Now let's talk about Moore. The first person I arrived at was Moore. I, I figured this must be the guy who first invented the graduated cylinder. He had come up during some of my searching on other glassware for this other video I was working on. And he really seemed like the guy. And so I was reading through this really big book of his. It's like 600 pages long. And you'll see why I thought it might have been him. So Moore was a German chemist. Initially, I stumbled upon him as some people claimed him to be the father of volumetric glassware. A graduated cylinder is a piece of volumetric glassware. So surely if he was the father of volumetric glassware, he should be the guy that invented it. I'm also going to do a bit of foreshadowing here. You're going to see why these types of claims are kind of hard to believe moving forward. 
Now, he made several contributions to chemistry beyond just being the quote-unquote father of volumetric glassware. One of them was that he had an early theory for the conservation of energy. He improved the design of the burette, and his design literally translates to the pinchcock burette. The clip that he used is called a Moore clip, and you still see them around in labs from time to time, which is uh, kind of satisfying for me to see. He also invented the Moore Wepsol scale, which is an early scale. He invented the cork borer. He invented the graduated pipette. And he has a salt named after him, ammonium iron 2 sulfate, which is called Moore salt. And during Moore's work, he developed some improvements to the burettes, as I was just saying. He was a solid chemist, clearly extremely skilled. And he has several drawings in this book of what definitely resemble graduated cylinders. Here's three. Two of these are definitely called burettes in his writings. Here you can see this lid is effectively a stopper with a straw and a really long straw. This is just an early prototype of a burette. But if you just take this off, this is a graduated cylinder. It's got a flat base. It's got major and minor graduations. This is clearly a grad cylinder. This is pretty, pretty encouraging to be the very first grad cylinder. What this actually translates to is a fusburet, which is just a foot burette, a burette with a foot. Here we have a mischcylinder, which is a mixing cylinder. This also looks like a graduated cylinder. It's a cylinder. It's graduated. I think that this qualifies as a grad cylinder. You can let me know if you disagree down below. And here we have a chameleon burette. And I wasn't really sure what a chameleon burette was for, but maybe it just kind of looks like a chameleon, so they called it that. I think all three of these totally count as graduated cylinders. I was fairly confident that this counted as the first graduated cylinder. But then I came across some references to another person called Gay-Lussac. And Gay-Lussac's burette was the one shown here, where we have part of the chameleon sticking out at the bottom. And it's otherwise the same, where we have graduations, both major and minor. And this was poured, so this doesn't have a base on the bottom. You can decide yourself whether or not you think that this counts as a graduated cylinder. But I think this still counts as a graduated cylinder. It's a cylinder with graduations, but it doesn't have a foot. I think that counts. And so it seemed to me, you know, Gay-Lussac is clearly the guy who invented this. And so maybe he was the original inventor. And so during some of my searching, I found out that he actually had some other designs. Gay-Lussac was a French chemist and physicist. He lived from 1778 till 1850. This is even earlier. And he was also claimed to be the father of volumetric analysis. Oh, where have we heard that before? He made several contributions to chemistry, one of which is extremely noteworthy. He discovered that water was made of hydrogen and oxygen, and they did this through electrolyzing water into hydrogen and oxygen. He also figured out that gases generated from a chemical reaction like this are always going to be in full integer ratios. He's also known for Gay-Lussac's law, which is V1 over V2 equals T1 over T2, which I thought was a nice, satisfying thing to come across. And he coined the terms pipette, burette, and titrate slash titration. This is Mr. Titration himself. So surely the guy that coined the term pipette and burette was the guy who created the first burette, a.k.a. the first graduated cylinder, right? Because essentially at this point, there's no clear distinction between a burette and a graduated cylinder. They're both graduated cylinders. One of them might have a spout at the bottom. One of them might have a spout at the top. Whether or not you have a spout from the bottom or top doesn't change the fact that it's a cylinder and that it's graduated in my mind. I also wanted to highlight that he was an opponent of mouth pipetting, and as Mr. Pipette himself, I thought that this was quite funny. Here it said, Gay-Lussac considered sucking the pipette by mouth extremely unhealthy and dangerous. In his first papers, he suggested immersing the pipette so deeply in the solution that the latter would rise to the mark by itself. Then you could just pinch off the top of the pipette with your finger, like you're taught in labs. Far too much solution was, however, needed in this case. Later, he constructed intricate devices, including taps, to avoid sucking by mouth for the filling of pipettes. Hence why it's really frustrating that almost 200 years later, people are still mouth pipetting in some countries. If you live in one of those countries, share this video with your teacher. Here are some of the different instruments Gay-Lussac used for his early titrations. I and K specifically here are clearly graduated cylinders. They're cylinders, they're graduated. If you think the spout invalidates I, K doesn't have a spout. This is a graduated cylinder. So we figured it out, right? Gay-Lussac is clearly the guy. Well, not quite. I was pretty satisfied, and that was going to be the end of the story. I was going to make this video. But I decided to do my due diligence and look a little bit harder. And by filtering for certain dates and times, I ended up looking in the older internet. And I found this quote. 
and it said, the roots of the automated laboratory liquid handling can be traced back to the increasing focus on analytical laboratory techniques in the late 18th century. De Crozil, a French chemist and pharmacist, invented and introduced the burette and pipette to science in 1795. So despite Gay-Lussac coining the terms burette and pipette, both of those things already existed because De Crozil had already created them. In his case, he didn't call it a burette. He called it a birolimitre. And there's several other similar names that he gives in his papers. It was a graduated cylinder. Here we have a source claiming that this is a graduated cylinder. There was someone before who had already created a graduated cylinder. And it turns out that those look even more like graduated cylinders than Gay-Lussac's burettes. So de Croisil was alive from 1751 to 1825. He was also a French chemist. And he was also claimed to be the inventor of volumetric analysis. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Wow, How? where have I heard that before? Not only is he considered to be the inventor of volumetric analysis, but in the references I'll include in this episode, there's two different sources that claim this. He created what's called an acetimetre, and he was using this for analyzing vinegar. Here's a drawing of what that setup looked like. You can see it's a cylinder, it even has a foot, and it has major and minor graduations. So this is clearly a graduated cylinder. In addition, he's made several different contributions to chemistry. He invented the portable still, which was used for the determination of alcohol in wine and other spirits. You could take it around and test alcohol. And 11 years after the liter was defined, he was using a graduated cylinder with milliliter increments on it. And so I thought that that was quite impressive. Here we have this little excerpt discussing his use of a graduated cylinder. Toward the close of his life, de Croisil combined the following in a single burette, which he called the polymètre. And he essentially takes four different things and combines them all together into one graduated cylinder. Unfortunately, people didn't adopt it when he made it. And it wasn't until many years later that Gay-Lussac built upon it and made more useful burettes that other people went and improved even more. And if you don't think that his earlier design from 1795 counts, this one only has major graduations. It doesn't have minor ones. It does still have a foot and it is still a cylinder. The one on the right is from 1806. And this is the vinegar graduated cylinder this definitely qualifies. So we've at least tracked this down to 1806. So none of this 1909 Einstein BS, this was done at least 100 years earlier. Yeah, I know, right? And so I was completely satisfied with this. So de Croisil is the inventor of the graduated cylinder, right? He is, right? He's got to be the inventor. There can't be anyone else, right? Well, not quite. So it turns out that there's this other guy called Guiton de Morfaux. And Guiton de Morfaux was also a French chemist. He was the inventor of the graduated measuring cylinder. This is the guy. He first used it in 1784. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to find an image of his graduated cylinder online. If any of you are able to find it, if you can send it to me, I'll make a YouTube community post and I'll make sure that everybody's able to see it because I think that would be great to share with everyone. I'm not sure if images of this exist in a book anywhere, but if anybody happens to find a book, I would be really excited to see it. There's a really good story here, and it's one of the last things I want to finish off this video with. He was a lawyer, but he became a chemist. Some of his contributions to chemistry include that he developed the first systematic method of chemical nomenclature, which is quite impressive. And he also made a graduated cylinder to analyze saltpeter. He was working in a saltpeter factory, and he ended up developing this technique to analyze saltpeter that required the use of a graduated cylinder. I originally had a really long segment about this, but I decided to cut it out of the video because it was just long-winded and it didn't add anything interesting to the video. But what was interesting was that he openly voted for the execution of Louis XVI, and this later got him discredited and he wasn't allowed to hold public lectures anymore, and so he stopped teaching chemistry after that happened. Now, what was that thing about him being a lawyer? So Guiton de Mofo was born in 1737 in Dijon, where his father taught law at the university. He himself studied law there and later continued his studies in Paris. It would appear, however, that this subject did not occupy him completely, for he started to study literature and began to write long satirical poems. In 1760, he returned to Dijon, where he was appointed a lawyer. He continued to write poetry, and soon, either because of his literary merits or because of his family's influence, he was elected a member of the Academy of Dijon. At one of the meetings of the Academy, a lecture on chemistry was given, and afterwards, Guiton made some critical comments on it. The lecturer replied that a lawyer and poet should not criticize subjects of which he had no understanding. This made Guiton rather angry, and in order to justify his comments, he began to study chemistry. He became so engrossed in this subject that he continued to study it for the rest of his life. I love this so much. The guy that invented the grad cylinder became a chemist, 
because he got mad at someone talking about chemistry and the guy's like you're not a chemist and he's like just you wait buddy he began to carry out experiments and published a number of papers in the journal of the academy partly with chemical and partly with juridicidal comments occasionally interspersed with a poem in 1776 he gave lectures on chemistry and in 1777 he published a book on the subject but he also turned his knowledge to practical use in 1778, he became a partner in a saltpeter factory, which he expanded in 1783 by adding a synthetic soda plant. This is like carbonate. By this time, his name had become quite famous, and he was asked to write the chemical section in the Great French Encyclopedia. He became so involved with his chemical and industrial occupations that in 1783, he gave up his position as a lawyer. So this is the story of Guiton de Mauveau. In conclusion, Albert Einstein did not invent the graduated cylinder in 1909. Louis Bernard Guiton de Beauvau invented the graduated cylinder in 1784. If you're not convinced that he invented an actual graduated cylinder because I wasn't able to find a picture of it from his original work, you can still settle for de Quazil's graduated cylinder in 1806 or his earlier one in 1795. So there you go, we've got to the bottom of it. I think the last comment here is that a burette and a graduated cylinder are clearly different but simultaneously very similar. If you're interested in seeing more videos on topics like this, make sure you smash that like button and share this video with a friend. And if you want to hear about all the interesting details in this video that I wasn't able to include, I'm considering making a video talking about it on my second channel. That's right. I made a second channel for random stuff, and I also just made a tier list video deciding which fruit is the best. If you want to check out that channel, I'm going to occasionally post some random stuff there, and it's less serious and more fun. There's a lot of other cool little interesting things I picked up along the way for this project, and I think it would be fun if I got to make it into another video. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.